All right, well, good morning. Go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to uh, Genesis chapter 4 today. We're going to keep pushing forward in our study uh, of the book of Genesis, remembering that um, as the first book of the Bible uh, in, our, in our inspired Word of God, uh, there are a lot of things that God uh, has here for us to teach us about uh, really our purpose and His plan uh, here on this earth. Uh, and we learned last week, or we looked at last week uh, from Genesis 3, how uh, mankind uh, tried to take matters into his own hand. Uh, how um, the serpent came into the Garden of Eden and uh, tempted Eve uh, to eat of the fruit that God had said previously, don't eat of it. And we looked at uh, some of the methods that he used. Uh, to, pers- to, to tempt her, to deceive her, how he first questioned God's word and uh, how she had uh, misinterpreted or misunderstood what Adam uh, had told her about the command not to eat of the tree and, and took, it to, uh, um, took it to an extreme that was um, not mandated by God. She had said, uh, you should not, she said, uh, God had told them not to eat of it or to even touch it, where God had just simply said, uh, don't eat of it. Um, So she misunderstood and misinterpreted what God had said, uh, and then Satan cast outright um, a denial upon the word of God, saying that God was was just a liar, and that uh, tempted Eve and deceived her to take of the fruit, and then she gave to Adam. And according to what we saw in the New Testament, Adam was not deceived, he just merely took of the fruit. We are not entirely sure of the reasons why. Uh, The Bible does not say, other than the fact that he was not deceived. Uh, His was an outright... Uh, rebellion. And so sin entered into the world. But even with that sin entering into the world, God's plan for our world was not ruined. Yes, the perfection had been shattered, but God had even promised uh, while uh, cursing the serpent uh, that he had a plan uh, for mankind's uh, redemption. Uh, Unfortunately, though, because of Adam's rebellion, uh, we would see these consequences of sin uh, reverberate even to this very day, uh, 6,000 uh, something years later. And so we're going to look at some of those repercussions uh, today in Genesis uh, chapter 4 as we talk about uh, the first children uh, on this new earth, Cain and Abel. So starting in verse uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Adam knew his wife, uh, Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, uh, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So as we look at Genesis chapter 4, we see uh, uh, the first birth. Uh, Adam knew his wife, a very um, apt description uh, for the marriage relationship, how two people who are married ought to know each other uh, completely. They are, as Adam had said uh, in the previous uh, two, two chapters ago, unified as one flesh. And so through this union, uh, they then start obeying God's command to be fruitful and multiply. Um, now, right now, they're only multiplying by one half. Um, but nonetheless, they have been fruitful. They have brought forth a child. And uh, Eve says that she has gotten a man from the Lord, uh, perhaps remembering the promise uh, of that or the the curse that God had put upon uh, Satan, that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And perhaps she thought that this was uh, God's promise already being fulfilled. We don't don't necessarily know. Uh, But we do know that uh, by saying, I have gotten a man from the Lord, that word gotten is literally what Cain's name means. It's the idea of acquiring uh, or procuring. That God has given to her, uh, a man-child, and uh, so that's what she names him. Well, then she gives birth to a second child uh, later on, and uh, it's, she named this one uh, Abel, and the name Abel just simply means uh, breath, vanity, or emptiness. There's speculation on why she named Abel this. Perhaps she thought Abel wasn't necessary, that God only required one man. I don't know. It seems a little strange that the first woman uh, would seem to not love her child in such a way as to call him emptiness or vanity. I, 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 don't, I don't really know. And the Bible does not say. We can speculate all day long what his name means. Uh, we do know that in 
um, biblical culture and, and even throughout much of history, names uh, had had some kind of power uh, associated with them. That the name, that the meaning of the name, uh, was very very important uh, to these biblical cultures. Um, we've kind of moved away from that in modern society. A lot of times um, these days, we just name our children uh, what sounds good. Um, you know, what, what we think would be a good sounding name for maybe perhaps a profession later on. I remember someone saying uh, that when they were picking the name for their kids, they didn't want to pick a name that would sound weird for a doctor or a lawyer or a politician. Uh, it wasn't that they necessarily cared about what the name meant. Uh, they just wanted the name to sound good should that person become important. Well, that was not true back then. And, and, and even still in a lot of cultures today, uh, the, name, the meaning of the name uh, was very important. Um, my, my own name, uh, when, when my parents, uh, when I was born to my parents, uh, my parents uh, tried to do uh, something very similar. They, they, they named me Lucas, which uh, in the Greek means light. And they were hoping that I would one day uh, be a light to those around me as commanded by Scripture. Uh, they named my brother uh, Alexander, a helper of mankind, uh, hoping that he would go on to uh, live up to his namesake and help others around him. Uh, and there are still people who, who do uh, think, think about the meaning of their name. So I don't know necessarily why um, Abel was named this. Perhaps there was some meaning, perhaps she thought, as some scholars speculate, that Abel, she thought Abel wasn't necessary to the fulfilling of God's plan. Uh, we don't entirely know, uh, but that is what his name means. So Cain uh, was the man that she had acquired from God, and then Abel was the second child um, as a breath uh, or as emptiness. Again, we're not necessarily sure why she named him that. We do see, though, in verse 2 that uh, the idea of labor continues. Uh, remember what I said in the previous uh, couple of lessons, that work was not the curse. Okay? God had commanded mankind to work even from his creation, to tend the garden, to keep it, um, to name, he was given the task of naming all of the animals. Uh, mankind has always had a job, but what the curse did was make work hard. It was now difficult. The ground would not just uh, easily uh, bring forth its fruit uh, for mankind. And so uh, Cain and Abel are put to work. Uh, Cain takes the job of being a farmer, uh, a tiller of the land, uh, the Bible says. <clears throat> and uh, he, be, or, uh, yeah, tiller of the ground. So he becomes a farmer, um, growing perhaps wheat uh, and other uh, grains that would become necessary to mankind understand that civilization hasn't really started yet. Uh, it's just Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, and then whatever other uh, children that are not currently mentioned. We do know that they had other children because it talks about um, Cain having a wife. Uh, so he, they would have had other children, but they're not really mentioned at this point. But they're a small, uh, tiny little family group uh, somewhere in uh, what we consider today possibly modern-day Iraq. Again, we're not entirely 100% sure, but based on what we see in Genesis 2, they're somewhere uh, in what we would call Mesopotamia, or what the ancient world called Mesopotamia, and what is now modern-day uh, Iraq. So he is tilling the ground, and Abel then becomes uh, a shepherd. He starts caring for uh, sheep, and, and that's his job. So whether they were assigned these tasks by Adam or whether they, as they grew older, they decided uh, what they preferred. Um, these are their jobs. And so this idea of labor continues. Uh, again, uh, it would not been, have been as easy for Cain uh, to take care of the ground as it had been for Adam uh, before the fall. And I'm sure perhaps uh, Abel had difficulty in caring for the sheep as they would not respond to his commands uh, nearly as easily as they perhaps had uh, for, uh, for Adam. But nonetheless, they have their jobs and they work at them. And they do take a certain measure of, of pride in their work. And we'll see that in, in the following verses. Let's look at verse, um, start at verse 3. In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, and Abel he also brought of his firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. 
And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So as they, as they labor um, in their respective uh, jobs, as Cain uh, works with the fields, and as Abel shepherds his sheep, uh, the time comes to make uh, some kind of sacrifice. Um, the Old Testament law had not been established yet, so there was not a, a set pattern of burnt offerings and wave offerings and first fruit offerings and drink offerings and, and all of those types of offerings that God would later command the children of Israel. Uh, this is just a, a simple offering that is being made, a simple sacrifice. Um, we do not know necessarily the intention of this offering. Uh, perhaps it was just simply to show respect to God, um, or perhaps it was meant uh, it was meant to symbolize what God had done with this with the slaying of the animal and the and the coats of skin. Perhaps it was an offering uh, of a, a, a type of sin offering. Again, we're not sure. It just simply says they offered uh, an offering. They gave a sacrifice. Uh, Cain's offering is rejected. It says he uh, brought forth of the fruit of the ground. Uh, an offering unto the Lord. So uh, Cain har takes in some of his harvest, and he takes that harvest, uh, and he offers it uh, to God. Uh, but it is uh, rejected. Uh, go ahead and turn real quickly over to Hebrews chapter 11. And when you get there, put a mark there. We'll be coming back to Hebrews 11 a couple of times, um, as there is some additional information uh, given to us uh, from or about this passage. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. So apparently what we see here, uh, as we look at this offering, um, Cain's offering was considered unacceptable. It was not as excellent as, uh, as Cain's. And there are a couple of things that we could see from our passage in Genesis chapter 4 as to why that might be. Uh, clearly he had an improper attitude uh, towards his offering as when it's rejected uh, he becomes angry about it. We do not see any kind of, of sorrow perhaps for, uh, for offering the wrong offering. We don't see any kind of attitude of, of repentance. Uh, we just simply see him getting angry. Uh, at God. And so there's already an improper attitude. And probably by this it indicates that uh, Cain's attitude when he was even offering uh, the sacrifice itself uh, was not appropriate. He did not have that proper humble attitude uh, towards God. Whether this was meant to be a blood sacrifice or not uh, at the moment is inconsequential. Clearly, based off of his reaction to his offering being rejected by the most holy, most powerful God, um, he is clearly not having the right attitude. Uh, it makes me think perhaps of, of someone who uh, is working in a church not because they want to please God, uh, but because they simply seek attention. And then when their uh, work in the church goes ignored, uh, or someone else perhaps takes the spotlight uh, for doing something else, that person throws a temper tantrum. I'm sure uh, most of us in here have seen something like that happen, or perhaps, unfortunately, some of us in here may have even been in that position where we were doing a service for God, not because we wanted to love God, uh, we were not offering ourselves up to God uh, in an appropriate manner. We were seeking the attention of men. And so when the attention of man was not turned to us or when we thought God wasn't paying us enough attention, uh, we got upset. Uh, this also brings to mind the Pharisees later on in, Matthew, in, 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 in the Gospels where they started out with perhaps noble intentions. They wanted to bring uh, Israel back to an understanding of the law. Uh, but as they started to do so, they, they did so with a wrong attitude. They wanted to uh, have the praise of men, and Jesus rebukes them for it. And rather, instead of saying, oh, you know what, you're right, we were wrong uh, in doing this, instead, they got angry and they ended up uh, crucifying Jesus. So we need to understand that based off of history and based off of what we, what we see elsewhere, 
clearly we could see from Cain's response to what God to God's rejection that he had an improper attitude. Perhaps this was also an improper sacrifice. Um, there is a great debate on whether or not Cain offering the fruit of the ground was the problem. Some say uh, you will find equally godly people on both sides of this discussion. Some people say Cain should have offered a blood sacrifice, and that's why God rejected him. And others say that no, it wasn't that necessarily that Cain uh, didn't offer a blood sacrifice, it was that he had that improper attitude. And if you look at the description of the sacrifices, you could see uh, even perhaps some of that attitude uh, bleeding into the sacrifice itself. Notice it says, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. There, there is no adjectives really prescribed to this offering. It's just the fruit of the ground. Not even the first fruits of the ground. Not even the best, perhaps. It's just he brings forth of the fruit of the ground. And it says, Abel brought a firstling of the flock. He did bring the first fruits of his flock and of the fat thereof. Okay, it wasn't that he just brought a firstling. He brought the best of the best. He brought the best of what he has, whereas with Cain, he just brought something. And so the, the great debate is, should Cain have offered a blood sacrifice? I tend to sit on the side of things that says, well, this wasn't necessarily a blood sacrifice issue. This was simply that Cain just kind of grabbed the, the first thing he could grab and wasn't really thinking through uh, what was the best that he could offer to God. Um, and then Abel did bring the best of what he had, and that's why the author of Hebrews said that he saw that Abel's sacrifice was more excellent than that of Cain's. It wasn't necessarily that Cain had offered the wrong thing, it was that he had the wrong attitude uh, throughout the entire process. He didn't bring the best of what he had. He did not uh, have the right attitude in bringing the sacrifice, whereas Abel brought the best of what he had, and not only that, he apparently uh, had the right attitude in doing so uh, because of that humility. So again, Abel's offering, Cain's offering is rejected. Abel's offering is found to be uh, more acceptable. <clears throat> so Cain then becomes very, very upset. And this is where his descent into sin um, gets even stronger. Uh, he has... Um, perhaps by this point already fallen into sin because he is jealous of what of the attention his brother receives from God. Um, but his sin goes even further. Uh, verse 6, The Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. So after Cain gets very, very upset, God goes to him and says, why are you upset? If you had done the right thing, then there's no reason to be upset. And if you didn't do the right thing, then you need to be concerned. Because sin is, sin is watching you right now. God warns Cain and says, if you don't fix what's going on right now, you are going to be, um, <clears throat> you are going to be uh, enslaved to sin. And so, but Cain does not listen, clearly. Uh, and so Cain's descent into sin so often matches how, well, we as humans over the next thousands of years would also fall into sin. It started with an incorrect attitude. Sin often starts with an incorrect attitude towards something good uh, or towards um, someone else. Perhaps it's uh, pride, as we looked at uh, in Genesis chapter 3 when we looked at uh, the fall of Satan. It's where the original sin was pride, uh, an incorrect attitude about oneself. Uh, so maybe it's an incorrect attitude towards yourself. Maybe it's uh, towards another individual. Um, but sin always starts uh, with an incorrect attitude, uh, usually some kind of pride. Uh, that then leads to improper thoughts, um, where we then start to think perhaps, um, we, we start to have that pity party uh, in ourselves, where, uh, well, it's not my fault. 
you know, I did what I could. Uh, everything else is so unfair. Um, or, you know, they don't deserve that. Um, they're not worthy. Uh, I should be the one getting, getting those things. I should be the one receiving that praise. I should be the one receiving that attention. They don't deserve uh, those things. Uh, and then even perhaps with that, well, you know, if I had the ability to, I would show them. I, I, would, uh, I, I would make sure that they knew their place. Um, or even, you know, perhaps, you know, how could I get this for myself, uh, even though, uh, how could I get for this for myself no matter what the cost? Well, what can I do, uh, it, what can I do to, to take this glory or to take this thing or to take this object, uh, to take it for myself? Um, and so the, the wheels start turning. Um, and so then those improper thoughts then lead to uh, immoral actions. So it starts with an incorrect attitude towards yourself or towards another person. It then turns into improper thoughts towards sin. And that's why Jesus makes such a big deal in the Gospels about how sin is not an outward action. Sin starts in the brain. Murder starts with hatred. And perhaps Jesus was thinking of that time where he told Cain that he, where he asked Cain, why are you angry? Maybe perhaps even while Jesus was saying that if you hate your brother, um, it, is a, it is the same as if you had murdered him. Perhaps he was thinking back to that time. Remember, Jesus is God. Jesus was here when this whole thing went down. So maybe while Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and talking to the Jews and saying, hey, if you are angry at your brother uh, or if you, are, if you are full of wrath towards uh, towards another, you have murdered them in your heart. Perhaps he was remembering this exact instant where Cain got so mad at his brother that his improper thoughts eventually turned into outward action. And we see that throughout the New Testament that sin is not just the outward action. Sin is not just what I do with my hands and with my body. Sin starts right here in the mind. And we see that even from Genesis 4. And in verse 8, he, they're in the field, and uh, Cain rises up against his brother and slays him. Perhaps they were having an argument. We don't know. Perhaps, um, you know, we here in the Western world classify murders with different degrees. Was this first degree murder? Was it premeditated? Did Cain intentionally bring his brother into the field to slay him? Was it second degree murder? You know, was it was it just a crime of passion? You know, were they out in the field and perhaps talking about maybe Abel asked, well, what did God tell you? And Cain got defensive and they started arguing and then Cain just, you know, smashed his brother's head against the rock. We don't know. We don't, the, the fact of the matter is, Whatever happened in this field, Cain killed Abel. His, in, his inside, uh, his interior attitude, his improper thoughts were then uh, carried out into a physical uh, immoral action. And so the first, uh, the first physical death on the planet uh, occurs, the first physical human death. Up to this point, no human at least for what we see in the record of Scripture, no human has physically died yet. This is the first of billions of deaths that would come afterwards as a result uh, of sin. And so then we come to verse 9. Uh, Cain attempts to cover up what he's done. Verse 9, the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? So God comes to Cain again. You know, for someone who, for, for someone who is such a negative attitude, uh, he sure is getting a lot of attention from God. And God says, hey, where's your brother? Now God, did, God knew. God knew what had happened, just like God knew where Adam and Eve were hiding in the garden. But we see here that Cain does the exact same thing that his parents did when they sinned. When Adam and Eve sinned, they covered, they didn't cover up, you know, they didn't try, they may have tried to hide the fruit, but they, they tried to cover themselves up. Well, Cain tries to not cover himself up, he tries to cover his brother up. And so we see um, 
the we we see again the carrying through of the sins uh, of the father, and this ought to be a warning to to us who are in uh, positions of authority, whether uh, as uh, head of the household, head of a family, uh, over children, or perhaps uh, over other people in, in a work environment, that those underneath us watch us. Now. Cain was not there in the garden when all this happened, but I am pretty sure that Adam and Eve would have told them uh, about what had happened. Adam and Eve would have told them uh, about the garden and what had transpired in the garden. And so Cain pulls a page from Adam's playbook and starts to try to cover things up. He starts starts to lie about it. Um, He takes it even one step further than Adam had, where Adam had just simply passed blame on to his wife Cain just per, just completely feigns ignorance. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's, what's going on here. And God knew exactly what was going on. But he wanted to uh, ask those questions. He wanted to get Cain to admit that what he... He wanted Cain to admit to what he had done. And that's, that's always a, a, a good practice in an authority position uh, when you're dealing with someone underneath you who has, who has done wrong is to, is to question them about it. Rather than immediately going and pointing fingers and, and say, look at what you've done, getting them to admit their own guilt is a sure way to, uh, to get a change to occur. Uh, because it's their own realization, oh yeah, I have done wrong. Um, and then surely, uh, when they start lying and covering it up, that's, it's a sign how much repentance is there. If they're trying to cover it up, there's, there's absolutely no repentance. And we see that Cain has uh, no repentance uh, here, So he tries to lie about his sin. He says, I know not. He knew exactly where his brother was. His brother was dead. Um, he says, am I my brother's keeper? Um, kind of insolence uh, in, his, in his tone, perhaps. Um, God said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. God looks at Cain and says, I know exactly what you've done. Your brother's blood is, is, is crying out to me from the ground. This is the first time um, that human blood has been shed. This is the first time that human blood is being poured out on the ground. And God says, look, I know exactly where your brother is. I know exactly what you've done. Don't play games. Now art thou cursed from the earth. I, I wonder what would have happened to Cain if he had repented. You know, would, would, God have, would God have punished him so harshly? I, I don't know. Uh, we're going to see later on that God does treat human life uh, incredibly valuably, uh, to the point where uh, he says that if, if a man kills another man, that the man who, who murdered should die. Um, so I don't know what God would have done uh, had Cain repented, but clearly Cain did not repent, so God curses him. Um, it says, uh, Now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened up her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground... It shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shall, be, shall thou be in the earth. This is a huge blow to Cain. Understand that societies that farm, that, that do agriculture similar to what Cain was doing, they cannot afford to move from place to place. Throughout history, you're going to see, especially in ancient history, you're going to see two groups of people that primarily tend to form. They're the hunter-gatherers, who just simply uh, roam about following things like the Native Americans following the buffalo herds, or the uh, the Mongolian steppe people following the horse uh, following the horse herds. They're not really interested in establishing any great kind of civilization. They're not really uh, interested uh, in establishing uh, a long-lasting. Uh, legacy. They are more just interested in following uh, the herds around. Whereas the farmers, they tend to stay in one area because they have to grow their crops year after year, and they have to find a place where they can grow their crops uh, year after year. And this is the type of man that Cain was. He was a farmer. He was the man who kept planting in those fields. And God is saying, first of all, every time you try to plant, it's not going to work for you. Now, he doesn't make the ground barren. He just says the, the earth's not going to yield you her strength. So whenever Cain would try to plant his crops, likely he would have received far less of a harvest than any other man would had it, had it been that man planting uh, those crops. And he's told you're going to be a vagabond and a fugitive. You're not going to be able to uh, stick around uh, in one place for very long. 
Uh, so he would receive no fruit for, fruit for his labor, and he would be forever uh, a fugitive. <clears throat> Cain, of course, doesn't appreciate this, as most people don't appreciate any punishment, so he complains. He says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Which, we might look at that and, and mock him for, for such an attitude, but bear in mind, God has just ripped from him his livelihood. And one thing that... Uh, counselors and, and, and psychologists agree on is, is a man takes identity in his work. God has ripped Cain's identity from him. And so while it's easy for us 6,000 years later to look back and say that Cain's just being a wimp, um, if my livelihood was stripped from me, if my ability to teach had been stripped from me, would I be, in, would I be any different than Cain at this point? Probably not. If God had, if God stripped my ability to teach, I, I can't imagine that I would have much of a different response uh, to Cain. Um, it says, "Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth, and from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me." Are there that many people in the earth at this point? <laughs> no, Cain had just subtracted the number of people from this earth. But I guarantee you that he probably sat there and knew what his daddy was going to do to him if he had ever gotten caught. If, if, daddy, ever got caught, if daddy ever caught up to him. If uh, any of his other siblings that, that would either be there then or that would come later, he's probably thinking, yeah, they're going to hurt me. They're going to kill me. And their descendants are going to hate me because they're forever going to be telling the story of how Cain, the big bad older brother, uh, killed the younger brother. And so Cain is scared. He's like, they're going to kill me. And, and I, don't, I don't, again, I don't blame him. There's only one family on the earth. And family bonds are tight. But when, when you do something of that magnitude, I've seen what happens uh, when, when, uh, when a child get, or when a, when a, when a person gets uh, uh, kicked out from their family. When, when, a, when someone in the family acts in such a way that they dishonor the family, I mean, throughout cultures in the whole world, there's this idea that you know, once you cross a certain line in a family, that's it. You're done. You're out of the family, and everyone in that family disowns you, and they, will, they, they do not see you. And in uh, some cultures, that's even uh, cause for death. And so Cain, again, he's, he's scared for his life, and he ought to be. He just killed another human being. And so... Uh, he, he, he rightfully says, you know, people who, uh, people who see me, they're going to want to kill me. The Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. God, even in punishment, still shows Cain mercy. He looks at Cain and says, All right, I'll protect you. You're not going to be killed for this. And he puts a mark on Cain and, and lets him go. Um giving him that small mercy uh, of an additional curse and, and a mark so that people would know, don't kill this person. Um, whatever, whatever that mark was, we do not know. Um, but Cain goes out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So uh, Cain, Cain, leaves, uh, Cain leaves everything behind. He takes with him his family because in verse 17 we see that Cain knew his wife and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of that city after the name of his son, Enoch. I think it's interesting. Cain's supposed to be a vagabond. He's supposed to be a he's supposed to be a nomad at this point. But it's not too much longer after that that he tries to uh, disobey um, God's curse. He tries to reverse God's curse. He builds a city. When you build a city, you're not intending to leave. And so perhaps this is Cain's way of trying to, trying to reverse God's curse. Well, I'm supposed to roam around the earth, but if I build this city around myself, uh, maybe I don't have to roam anymore. We, we don't know necessarily Cain's intention, um, but he builds, he builds up this town, calls it after his son, and then his son has children, and those children have children. And we come to um, Cain's, let's see, is that son, grandson, great-grandson, great-great-grandson, great-great-great-grandson Lamech uh, in verse 19. So verse 17, we see that part of Cain's legacy is a city, uh, the first city that is mentioned being built, the city of Enoch. Uh, Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, the other one was Zillah. And Ada bare Jabel. He was the father of such that dwell in tents. 
and of such as have cattle. So part of Cain's legacy is he becomes the ancestor of nomads during this time. And his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of such as handle the harp and the organ. So Cain's legacy is that of starting the idea of uh, music, musical instruments. Um, this is the first mention of such things. Uh, Zilla, she also bear uh, Tubal Cain, who was an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. So Cain's legacy is that of really starting a lot of worldly civilizations. Uh, he starts, um, he becomes the father, the ancestor of nomadic tribes uh, during this time. Uh, he becomes uh, the ancestor of the one who would bring musical instruments uh, into the world. He becomes the father of the one who would um, become an artificer or, or, a, or a smith or a craftsman, um, making tools of, of brass and iron. Uh, I, I want to point out that part where it says of iron really quickly because um, after the flood, the world is going to go backwards technologically. Um, we don't see iron again until we, see the, until we come across the Hittite nation. Um, hundreds of years later. Um, and in the meantime, people are using brass and bronze and copper. But even before the flood, they knew how to use iron. And I bring that up because it's very important to understand that pre-Diluvian man was intelligent. Pre-flood man was intelligent. These people lived before the flood. We don't know exactly the full extent of their technological um, of their technological uh, abilities, um, but evolutionists would have us believe that that ancient man was was technologically backwards, that they were unintelligent, that they did not have any technology. But the but the Bible is here is, is very clear. Before the flood, they even knew how to use iron, which to our modern mind is like, well, what's the big deal in that? Well, back then, iron was the strongest of metals, but it was also one of the hardest to work. If you didn't know how to work iron properly, it would, not, it would not fulfill its function. But here we see that one of Cain's descendants is teaching others around him, hey, here's how you use iron, uh, which would not be seen again after the flood uh, for hundreds of years. We also see, though, that Cain's history of violence follows him even after his death. Um, verse 23 and 24, Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech. Hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding, and a young man to my hurt. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. So this great, great, great grandson of Cain goes to his wives and says, I had a fight with a man and I killed him. Notice it says he has slain a man to his wounding. This was not cold-blooded murder like Cain with Abel. Um, this was Lamech getting into a fight with another one uh, of his family members. Okay, bear in mind, they're all still pretty closely related. I'm sure the family tree would have been easy to follow. And so Lamech gets into a fight with another young man, possibly of his own family line. Uh, and the two of them fight and he slays him. Okay, so we see violence continuing onward. It's not that these people lived in, in peace and harmony with one another. Clearly, there is still violence uh, in between people. And so then Lamech makes uh, the statement that if, if Cain was going to be uh, punished, um, if, Cain, if, if Cain being killed was going to be punished sevenfold, then if someone hurt Lamech, that person would be punished 490 times over. Um, why he made that statement, I have no idea. But we can see that Cain's legacy of violence uh, continues onward. As we finish up, uh, we want to take a look at chapter 5, and we're going to go through chapter 5 uh, rather quickly, and I'm not going to read everything, but um, we start the genealogy of Adam and the line of Seth, or Seth's godly line. Adam lives 130 years uh, and calls him, and, and then has a son, and called his name Seth. And then it says, And the days of Adam after he begotten Seth were 800 years, and he begat sons and daughters, and all the days that Adam, days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Uh, so first we see that Seth is born, the replacement uh, to Abel. His name means substitution or replacement when this child was born. Uh, Eve saw this child as that replacement uh, for 
Abel, and then they have more uh, sons and daughters after. We see all throughout Genesis 5 uh, that this is a record of death. Um, Seth lived 912 years, and he died. Enos lived uh, 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived uh, 910 years, and he died. Mahalil lived 895 years, and he died. Jared lives uh, 800 years, uh, or 962 years, and he dies. Uh, and then we come to Enoch, which is an astonishing exception to this record of death. So we're seeing death after death after death. All this, all this death is taking place. And then we come uh, to Enoch. It says, Enoch lived 65 years, begat Methuselah, and Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, perhaps we may not understand what it means uh, that God took him. Uh, verse 5 of Hebrews 11, I told you to put a marker there, so if you did, you can flip back very quickly. Um, but it says that in verse 5 of Hebrews 11, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him uh, or moved him uh, into heaven. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. And so we see death after death after death. But then with Enoch, Enoch pleased God so much that God did not allow him to see the curse of death. He instead just removed him 365 years after he was born. Um, so compared to these others who lived 960 years or uh, 912 or 895, 365 years isn't that long, but he never got to experience the curse of death because, according to Hebrews 11.6, he had such great faith that God was pleased with him to the point where he took him. And lastly, we see, we see another record of death, Methuselah, um, lives 969 years, the, the oldest living man um, in history, 969 years, Methuselah. Uh, Methuselah gives birth to a son named Lamech, not to be confused with the Lamech of Cain's line. These are two different Lamechs. The Lamech of Cain's line killed a man. Uh, this, the Lamech of Seth's line, was the father of Noah. And he called his son, his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and our toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. So when Noah is born, <coughs> when Noah is born, uh, Lamech finds comfort in Noah's birth, saying this man is going to give us comfort um, through the cursing uh, of the ground um, concerning our work and our toil of hands. Now I'm sure Lamech could see the society around him falling apart. We're going to see in the next chapter uh, that society is really becoming exceedingly wicked. And Lamech was there for it. He was watching a society burn down around him. And this son comes forth and he says, I find comfort in this son. Um, perhaps he did not know what kind of comfort he was going to find in his son. Um, but nonetheless, um, Lamech finds comfort in Noah. And Noah is where we're going to pick up uh, in the next lesson. Thank you all for uh, your attention.